I am not an expert in evolution. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, I come at uh, this evolutionary thing from a different perspective. Uh, I have spent the last year creating a podcast called Cramped. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, all about period pain and why we don't know anything about it. And can we learn anything about it? Who's doing this? Who's, <laughs> how many people get severe period pain? We can't, do you know we can't actually answer that question? That's crazy. Uh, so naturally, after spending a year focused on the question of like, why do we have period pain and what can we do about it? Uh, I zoomed out a little uh, for fun, for relaxation, and <laughs> I uh, decided to focus on uh, a different question. Oop, not that. That's me. Uh, <laughs> which is, why, wait a minute, why do we do this at all? Why do we menstruate? Um, so, look, if you're uncomfortable with it, you're not going to be by the end of it, because I'm going <laughs> to, I have been desensitized by a full year of reading, hearing, and talking about menstruation and period pain, and now you're going to get a boot camp in that, so deal with it. Woo! Uh, why do humans menstruate? Um, it seems like a really simple answer. Does anyone have an answer for this they'd like to call out? Careful. <laughs> Men, say no. <laughs> We know you don't know, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we, the thing we probably know is that we menstruate because an egg has not been fertilized and it's time to like start over and shed the uterine lining and try again. But why do we do it like we do it? <laughs> why do we bleed out of our bodies? That is not a super common thing. Um, very few species menstruate. We are uh, in a very small club that includes simians. Who is selective? <laughs> some bats, Whoa. not all bats, just some, and very specifically, the elephant shrew. <laughs> this is the kind of club where we're, if you showed up to this club, you'd be like, why, why are we all here? <laughs> Did you get, you got the invite? Wh why? <laughs> Does anyone know? Um, and we actually belong to an even more selective group uh, overt menstruators. Uh, so that so while all of those species menstruate, uh, they mostly reabsorb the blood and uterine lining because they can't afford to lose those calories. They can't afford to lose that material. We uh, are overt menstruators, which means we bleed enough to notice. And it is us <laughs> and chimpanzees <laughs> who do overt menstruation. And it makes sense that not a lot of species do this, right? Because it's not super helpful to be out in the woods bleeding a bunch, <laughs> just generally in terms of survival. And so this has become, a re it's also really metabolically expensive. So we must do this for a reason. There must be a really beneficial reason that we do this kind of overt menstruation. Um, so, Early theories about overt menstruation, uh, so we're talking 13th century, uh, include this gem from uh, Cecco Dascoli. I don't know if I'm saying that right, and I don't care. <laughs> um, or, yeah, sorry, 14th century, my bad, 1300s. Uh, and that is, women's bodies are inferior to men's. They menstruate every month because they are by nature imperfect beings. <laughs> uh, Cecco Descoli, uh, was he a doctor? Sorta, uh, in terms of if you could be a doctor in the 1300s. Yeah, he was also a poet and an astrologer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> which uh, I live in LA now and I can tell you, it's coming back. <laughs> Other people are doing this now. Also, not a very good poem. <laughs> One assumes it sounds better in Italian. It really, it's, it's read it like a haiku. It's like <laughs> <laughs> maybe like a long haiku, maybe. Um, so okay. this idea, though, stuck around. This idea that women menstruate just because they suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> women menstruate because their bodies are not as perfect as men's bodies. That's why. <laughs> it kind of stuck around um, into the modern age. Uh, but it sort of sounds like this now. Uh, this menstruation is the unfortunate and possibly unnecessary byproduct of hormonal cycling is the new um, poem. <laughs> but other people have proposed other ideas because, you know, this doesn't satisfy the question. This expensive, 
Uh, this expensive process did not evolve for no reason. So there has to be a reason. And in 1993, an evolutionary, yeah, late. <laughs> in terms of major evolutionary biology theories, late. Um, uh, someone named Margie Prophet at UC Berkeley published a paper outlining a theory um, that rather than being like a stupid, silly waste of time, waste of energy and resources, uh, thing that women's bodies do just to like be annoying, um, <laughs> There might actually be a reason, and she published this in the Quarterly Review of Biology, like a legit thing. Um, she suggested, there, there were a lot of reactions to her proposal, though. Uh, a lot of other scientists and doctors had, like, big feelings about the proposal. Uh, so she suggested, she, uh, this is the title of her paper, Menstruation as a Defense Against Pathogens Transported by Sperm. Mm -hmm. A lot of people seem to identify with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So her theory was that menstruation uh, developed in order to protect the uterus from invading bacteria that came in on foreign sperm. Not foreign like somebody from another country's sperm, <laughs> but like foreign like outside the body. Um, that menstruation was a way to clean out the uterus and to prevent infection. Um, so not just, oh, women do this to be annoying, but this is a thing that protects the woman's health or the person with the uterus's health. Uh, she, oh, this is literally the first <laughs> very short sentence of the abstract. <laughs> Sperms are vectors of disease. <laughs> and so, you know, many evolutionary biologists and doctors and gynecologists considered this a ridiculous idea and Margie Prophet a ridiculous person, despite the fact that she had been awarded the MacArthur Genius Grant. <laughs> yeah, this was uh, her first uh, her theory released under that grant. And so, uh, so they really... Oh, yeah, sorry, there's one more sentence you I really wanted to bring attention to there, but yes, I could go back too far. Sorry, this is not worth it anymore. Well, you would think that they would have uh, had more respect for her predictions because she was a prophet. <laughs> yes, there you go, okay. <laughs> <laughs> was that enough time for you to find the slide? <laughs> you did a really good job, thank nice. you for vaping. Cool. <laughs> so she proposed that menstruation functions to protect the uterus and oviducts from colonization by pathogens, which I love the use of the word colonization. <laughs> Um, hating sperm and colonization, <laughs> hero. Um, so, yeah, doctors really did not like this. They wanted her to take her MacArthur Genius Grant and go home. However, the a lot of these doctors and scientists were the same ones that up until the 1970s thought menotoxin was a real thing. Has anyone heard of menotoxin? Yeah, okay, well, I get to tell you, between the 1950s and the 1970s, literal scientists and doctors thought that women on their periods were poisonous. <laughs> I'm not kidding. There were studies where they would have a woman on her period hold a bouquet of flowers and take a picture of the flowers before and a picture after and be like, look, they wilted, she's poisoned. <laughs> They would take menstrual blood and uh, inject it into rats and then be like, look, the rat died. <laughs> poison. Poison. And it, later it turns out um, blood is a really good place to grow bacteria. And that's why the rats died. Just like sperm. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Many, you could grow bacteria anywhere you want. <laughs> So Margie Prophet uh, was, dealing, was dealing with a lot of uh, crap in the medical and evolutionary biology fields, but there's not no reason <laughs> to not <laughs> believe her, or it, like there's not no reason to be like, huh, because Margie Prophet, uh, despite having so many, she had a, um, uh, a profile done of her in People magazine when this, in 1993, when this came out. The New York Times did a profile on her and her theories. Like, she was a star, like a breakthrough star from the medical and uh, evolutionary biology fields 
into the mainstream. People like knew who she was. And yet, she did not have a degree in evolutionary biology. She had degrees, but they were in political philosophy and physics. And then she had also studied mathematics and astronomy, which like we love, we love the, all those things. I don't know how you get to writing a paper on evolutionary biology from there. Interesting, okay, maybe she's just, you know, a Renaissance woman, she's so smart. Um, she also said in these high profile interviews with like the New York Times and People Magazine and like all these, all these different places, she told them that this theory of menstruation uh, came to her in a dream. And it was a dream of black triangles embedded in a red fluid. And that she woke up and was like, that's it. Menstruation avoids uh, pathogens. And it's like, look, I don't care where you got the idea. Don't tell people that. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we owe all those old male doctors an apology. <laughs> No, I, I, truly, there's no problem with getting an idea from a dream. Generally, if it's in a scientific field, don't tell the New York Times that you got this idea in a dream. That's all I'm saying. Um, the fact that the press was obsessed with her um, made her, the, you know, there's always backlash when someone becomes kind of a critical darling. And she was such a darling uh, that people really did not trust her anymore. Um, so... Unfortunately, the last piece of uh, the puzzle with Margie Prophet is that she disappeared off the face of the earth from 2005 to 2012. And not like, oh, nobody heard from her, like she didn't publish any papers. Like, she, her mom filed a missing persons report. Uh, <laughs> Psychology Today, the magazine, did, I don't know why this was their purview, but <laughs> they did an in-depth investigation into this missing evolutionary biologist, spoke to all her ex-boyfriends, and asked them what they thought happened to her. And when that was published in 2012, she, uh, Margie Prophet saw it, called her mom, and was like, I did not know you were looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, details are sketchy on where she was that whole time, but all her mom would say is that it, uh, religion was involved. So she joined a cult. Oh. Um, so, like, do I want to see a Hulu documentary about her? Desperately. <laughs> Desperately. Do we maybe need to take her evolutionary theories with a grain of salt? Well, Nikola Tesla was in love with a pigeon. So, like, I think we could give her a pass. <laughs> so why do we menstruate? <laughs> oh yeah. Right? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> so why do we menstruate? Um, there's probably not one reason. Um, it does seem to be more, uh, re research has been done on whether it is more energy efficient uh, for us to build a lining and then shed it and then rebuild it every month. And it turns out that is more energy efficient than just keeping the same lining like in good shape the whole month long over and over. Um, but in terms of why we bleed instead of reabsorbing it, um, we don't have that question fully answered. Um, we don't really know. For the podcast, I did speak to um, biological anthropologist Kate Clancy, who wrote this excellent book, uh, and she <laughs> reminded me that evolution is not neat and tidy. Yeah. yeah, evolution cares that something works good enough. It doesn't really perfect anything. <laughs> it says, great, and I relate. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but she also told me about a new theory of menstruation uh, that it's our body's way of practicing building the lining of our uterus because when people who have not had a lot of practice who have not had a lot of menstrual cycles get pregnant they are at higher risk for uh, some things like preeclampsia that happen when the fetus does not uh, attach securely to the lining of the uterus so we may actually need that practice every month to build a better uterine lining and get rid of it and build it again. And does anyone remember this meme or am I old? <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> so we don't totally know. Oh, yeah, scarlet ceiling. Um, this is another really, really amazing thing uh, that I learned about menstruation. Um, so... Uh, menstruation is the only process in the human body after we are fetuses where uh, we are able to do scarless healing. If you are a person who menstruates, 
your uh, uterus, your uterine lining is basically an open wound every time you menstruate, but it heals with no scarring and no loss of function. And nowhere else in the human body after we're fetuses does that. And in fact, scientists are now able to, uh, they are working on currently taking uh, menstrual effluent and isolating the uh, healing factors that facilitate that scarless healing and using it to heal burns and wounds uh, and creating better scarless healing. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't know why, but we do it. <laughs> um, so, we don't, Sti we still don't know the answer to this question fully, but I think at this point we can be pretty sure that it's not because we're inferior and it's not because we're imperfect. And it might help for you to know that Checo Dascoli was burned at the stake <laughs> <laughs> after he wrote this poem. Um, unfortunately, it was not because uh, of his raging medical and poetic misogyny. Everyone was fine with that in the 1300s. Um, it was because he read Jesus Christ's horoscope. <laughs> and the Catholic Church was like, absolutely not. <laughs> and Jesus Christ, according to Checo Dascoli, was a Pisces. <laughs> uh, so all in all, though, I'm counting uh, Checo Dascoli uh, very much a win. Woo!